brick down there. High tech uh, yeah, wire. It's nice. Harness. <laughs> it's a harness. Welcome to Purdue University and the Security Seminar, uh, sponsored by Sirius. Uh, today our speaker is Ed Finkler, spoken on topics related to web application security at a number of conferences and workshops, and today speaks to us about a multi-layered approach to web application defense. Best of all, Ed works for us at Sirius. He's our webmaster. Ed? Hey. Um, yeah, I, uh, I do the web stuff for Sirius, and... Um, what I'm going to try to talk about today is kind of, it's kind of a meat and potatoes talk about um, a multi-layered, kind of multidisciplinary approach uh, to uh, defending web applications. Um, it's uh, we're going to cover it's going to cover a lot of disparate areas, um, some kind of network architecture stuff, some hardware stuff, uh, server or server software configuration. Uh, programmatic stuff. Um, basically what I'm trying to get across with this is to give uh, kind of a feel for what are the kinds of things that go into web application security. What are the different areas, things that you need to think about when you're doing that. Um, so yeah. Um, it's Web application defense, I'm, I, I don't know if I'd go so far to say it's any more complex than other issues. It's not, uh, there's certainly more complex things in, in the area of information security, but it's um, interesting and can be challenging because of its multidisciplinary nature. Um, to defend web apps properly, you really have to have a team of folks who have good understandings of uh, configuration of hardware, um, network, network architectures, uh, operating system configuration stuff, uh, server daemon configs with your server softwares, uh, web servers, database servers, things like that, and also programming. Um, come on, the uh, uh, issues of secure programming um, techniques and, and and things like that. Um, the first kind of thing I'm going to touch on is is what I is usually a, a term that people cringe at: security through obscurity, and. Um, I don't think it's a good thing to rely on by itself, but it can be fairly useful uh, in certain circumstances uh, as sort of a way of staying out of out of the firing line. Um, basically, the idea is that you kind of keep quiet and you don't want to attract attention to yourself by announcing information about what kinds of things that you're running. Um, there have uh, proven a number of... Um, uh, an example would be uh, the Sancy worm that attacked uh, PHB BB installs. Um, what it did was it actually used Google as sort of a reconnaissance system and would search for version strings of a particular web application called PHP BB, would look for, and those are displayed on almost you know every install unless someone had customized the template to, to take that part out of it. So every install of this application, which is quite a popular bulletin board application, um, would display a version string at the bottom of the page. Well, it would use Google to search for that version string to try to identify uh, vulnerable installs of this and then would attack them automatically. Um, basically, the idea here uh, is that you don't want to give out those kinds of inf that kind of information. So you want to turn off all of what I'd call server signatures. Those would include things um, like if you're running a web server and in the headers it reports that you... By, by default, let's say in a, on an Apache install, it will report what version of Apache you're running um, and all of the modules that you have running. And at very least, I think it will typically include the OS. It'll include the OS you're running, and like if it's what uh, the Linux distro, it'll include that distro and what version you're running of that and that kind of stuff. Um, with a tool like Apache Mod Security, which we'll talk about in a little bit, which is an add-on module uh, for Apache, you can disable that entirely, or you can change that to any arbitrary string you want to. It makes it a lot easier to do it. Otherwise, I believe to change that string uh, to something else, um, 
I believe you have to actually uh, make a change to the source code of Apache and recompile it. Um, you may also find that sometimes the scripting languages that you're using are inserting info into, um, are, are, is, is, is uh, reporting information about that. Um, PHP by default, I believe, will um, report itself and insert something into the um, HTTP headers that says, you know, X uh, PHP version uh, 5.1.2 or something like that. So, again, you want to go into, if you, you want to examine those kinds of things in, in your web application stack and find, situ find the information that's reporting and pull that stuff out in any way that you can. Um, it's obviously, it's not a, it's not a, it doesn't actually really defend against anything, but it keeps you from a, attracting attention. Um, and then sort of a final thing was uh, turn off any error reporting to the browser. By uh, it, uh, It's a typical thing that you don't want production machines to actually report any kind of detailed error information uh, back to the user. Obviously, you want to log that, and you'll log that in internal system logs and stuff like that. But um, if you've used you know plenty of web applications, you'll probably often see a... Uh, You'll run across if there's some misconfiguration or problem with the server, it'll report out something like, uh, you know, error at line such and such on, you know, on the, in this file, and it'll give a full pass to that file. Well, that's an information disclosure issue, and it may not be a huge thing, but it may give an attacker some ideas about what kind of system they're working with and potentially what kinds of things they should be looking for to get into it. Um, most of the stuff I'm going to focus on here would be dealing with an open source software web stack, um, which is generally, it's some kind of Unix variant, um, Solaris or Linux. Um, those are the ones that we generally run at Sirius. Um, uh, we, uh, almost uh, all the time, you're going to be running Apache. There's a couple other options, Light HTTPD, stuff like that. But generally, Apache is, is by far the most popular web server you're going to see. Um, for so your application logic, you're going to be running probably one of the P's, PHP, Perl, Python. Uh, some folks will run Ruby, um, uh, and Ruby on Rails is a popular application framework built on Ruby that uh, is, is uh, used often. Uh, it's gaining some popularity. And then some kind of database server. Um, I'm most familiar with MySQL and PostgreSQL, um, but there are certainly... You know, uh, there's uh, you may be running some commercial stuff, Oracle, uh, DB2, MSSQL. Most of these things are going to be most of the techniques and the kinds of things we're talking about are going to be applicable to a number of setups. Even if, say, you're running IIS with ASP.NET, something like that. So uh, th these kinds of things are going to be applicable in most cases. But my my strongest familiarity is with these, and and it'll probably be mostly applicable to that. Um, the first kind of line of defense you're going to see are firewalls, and th that's a, a common thing. Everybody's, you know, it's expected that you're going to have uh, some kind of network firewall uh, that's that's filtering traffic, um, you know, set up, and that, that, that would be a key part of a network architecture. Um, OS-level firewalls are going to be common, too. Um, something like uh, the Linux IP table stuff that's built into the 2.4 kernel and above. Things like that. Um, what I think is kind of a new thing, is uh, more particular to web applications, are the this, uh, idea of web application firewalls. And these are a little bit different in that they don't just necessarily filter, um, say, what ports things are coming in on and what types of packets you see. But generally what they'll do is they actually are going to be able to scan the traffic that's coming in, the payloads that are being sent um, from clients up to the web server. And they're going to... Uh, scan that, and you can build it. it, it they'll work differently. The one I'm going to be talking about is Mod Security, and with those, what you can do is you basically build up a set of rules that it it basically compares um, the the incoming traffic to, and also potentially the outgoing traffic, and it does certain things. It throws up an error message, or it log, or it throws up an error and and, and stops the execution of that um, request, or it logs it out, or things like that. Um, so, you know, a basic simple diagram for that would be something like this. And I, I think the, the important thing here is that you've got something, you've got a network firewall appliance, um, you've got a, your firewall running uh, that's on an OS level, and you have a web application firewall. So you've really got three levels of defense before you even hit your web application. 
I think that's a key thing, and I, what I kind of want to emphasize over and over is you're going to some through a lot of this, you may see redundancy where we're basically defending against the same kinds of things two or three times. But the idea is if you screw something up in one place, hopefully you won't screw it up in the other place. Uh, you hope. Um, or if you miss something on one level, it can drop down, but you've still got another line of defense before that. So mod security for Apache, that's um, a really, really good tool. Um, and it's at the point where I feel that if you're running Apache, you're running, uh, basically I think that it's a, it's a requirement. It's not part of the uh, standard Apache distribution as it is now, but I would not roll out an, uh, an instance of Apache running without it. It's a very powerful open source web app firewall. Um, there is uh, commercial support for it, so you can, if if you know you're uh, working in some in a, in a business or enterprise level and they want that, you can you can get those kinds of things. Um, but like I described before, it basically intercepts exam as an acts upon incoming and outgoing uh, payloads, the data that say a web browser is sending to the uh, to the server, and it's important that it can do both incoming and outgoing. Um, we'll talk about that in, in just a sec. It also makes what they call chew rooting, um, where you are restricting how what the web server can do on, within the system um, and changing things like the server signature, which we talked about before. It makes doing those things quite a bit easier. Um, that's one of the nice advantages of mod security. It has a few different features like that, but primarily... The interesting thing is its uh, ability to uh, filter and, and act upon certain things. So, actually, this might be misleading because I'm not sure that it actually does any sanitization. I should probably change that. Um, but what it can do is, again, you're going to get input from some arbitrary uh, client online, and it will come in... Uh, to the web, to your web application, and um, Apache is going to the, the mod security in Apache is going to look at each of the different sets of information that you're getting, and look at it. And it could be something as simple as just a regular expression look to say, um, okay, if if the uh, information we're getting contains this kind of a string uh, that is indicative that this might be some kind of attack that they're sending, um, reject that or log it or you know, do a number of, of actions on it. Um, it's not on by default, but Mod Security can also do the same thing for output from the web server. So that if for some reason, in, in, on, uh, in one of these levels, whether on, in the web application firewall level or within uh, the web application itself or what have you, if for some reason uh, a malicious user gets your web application to spit out something uh, bad back to a browser, uh, it can cache it on the while it's going out, so it can examine that stuff and do the same kinds of things to it, either log or deny the request or what have you. Um, so, kind of keeping Apache on a leash. Um, uh, the key things that I see for this are if you have dynamic code, that would be if you're writing something, say like in PHP, Perl, Python, that kind of thing. I really always recommend that, especially on what we call shared servers, that you do something that compartmentalizes it so that particular applications or particular, um, say, uh, domains or things like that, you, you compartmentalize them so they're running under different user accounts on the system. The idea with that is it's sort of like on a ship where you, uh, you have, uh, you can, what do you call that, where you close off uh, the... Uh, batten down the hatches. Yeah, you batten down the hatches, and, and it's compartmentalized, so you can close off certain sections of the ship. So if, basically, if one gets punctured and it starts flooding, um, if, if somebody write, if has some bad code on their system, and uh, on your system, and has a, has, a, has a vulnerable web application, they, that can't be used as a way to get into the entire system and affect other users on there. And that kind of thing. It, it basically compartmentalizes it so the damage is restricted to what potential damage is restricted to what that user account can access. And obviously you set it up so it can only access what it needs to. Uh, so that's why it's particularly important on shared servers. If you uh, 
I ever have an opportunity to uh, look at setups uh, for you know most popular web hosting uh, setups, they have you know maybe a hundred uh, users, a hundred different accounts on, and a hundred different virtual domains running on a particular machine. Um, if you aren't uh, doing something like sue exacting it or doing something where you're wrapping your CGI so that they're executing on a, on a particular user and each one of those is executing on a different user, you have a real potential for one particular, for one uh, web application that's under one user's account to, dis to take out the whole system. And it's, uh, it becomes a real problem. So that basically, again, that kind of compartmentalizes stuff. Um, the other thing is is chi rooting jailing the uh, Apache is basically keeping the Apache processes uh, your your web server processes uh, from accessing files outside of this jail sort of root. Uh, so if you have Apache uh, set up to exit to sit in a particular you know directory on your system you know two or three levels down, you would set your root level at at a certain point and then the Apache process. Which includes any of the dynamic stuff that it's doing, any you know dynamic code that people have written, uh, PHP scripts, Perl scripts, Python scripts, Ruby scripts, things like that. They're not going to be able to go outside of that structure, um, so they're not going to be able to go up and say, "Oh, I want to go up and go into the Etsy um, directory and start you know mucking around and looking at configuration files and password files and stuff like that." Um, and as I said before, uh, mod security. Um, or there's one that just is for this called mod uh, shoe root is uh, is another module for Apache. Make this a lot easier uh, to do it by hand without these uh, process without these modules um, is much more difficult. It's possible, but um, the expo it takes two or three pages to you know to, to write out how it, how you do it, and it's a lot easier to do it this way. Um, so we're going to talk about some kind of programming techniques here where you're talking about web application development when you're um, actually writing the applications themselves in, in, in Perl or Python, what, what have you. The, the basic kind of idea here, um, and a basic sort of mantra for this, uh, is that you filter everything coming in and you escape everything going out. Um, and only when you are, well, I wouldn't even say that. Um, I was going to say, only when you're really sure do you not do that. Uh, but you have to be very careful of that and very aware of it. But, um, and, and with this diagram, what it kind of shows is that you have a few different, the kinds of things that are coming in. You're going to have things um, that are coming in on a few different levels. On the get level, they call that in the HTTP protocol. Uh, the post level, uh, cookies that are stored in the browser, and also uh, file uploads, things like that. Um, and the web application itself can spit out things, and these are the kinds of things that get spit back out from the web application that can do nasty things to the client or trick the client into doing things that are not good. Um, it's going to be able to send things like HTML and CSS. Those kinds of things are generally not too worrisome. But uh, JavaScript that gets executed by the client um, is potentially very problematic, uh, especially typically JavaScript has access to your cookie information, um, uh, can and, and, and can take that, can can read that stuff, and then say pass that information on to another server, uh, things like that. Um, Plugin content is a is a problematic thing. Um, that was I don't know, was it a month ago, a month and a half ago, where um, there a whole. Uh, that was uh, in Flash version 8 um, was exploited on, um, well, there's actually been a couple th uh, things on MySpace, but a recent one was a, uh, a banner ad that was put into rotation on MySpace, uh, a Flash banner ad, um, utilized a, um, a hole in the, in the Flash plugin that uh, allowed... Uh, the uh, allowed this 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 banner ad, this ba but basically a little flash applet to install spyware on people's Windows machines, and supposedly there was some uh, there were some statistics to indicate that there may have been up to a million uh, infected machines based on that. Um, but one of the problems that you see with MySpace in particular is that they allow people to embed arbitrary. Um, 
plugin uh, stuff uh, by using by allowing them to put in the embed tag, so that people can put in things like uh, Windows Media Player, Applet stuff, uh, QuickTime. Uh, and flash things, and if there are any vulnerabilities in the plugin ar- in the, the plugin architecture for that, then it's extremely problematic. Um, and then cookies are the same thing. A web ap- application uh, will can kick back and and set a cookie, and that potentially could be have some kind of malicious information or malicious uh, kinds of stuff in it, and make the client do bad things. So filtering at the code level, how you're going to do this is going to vary a lot based on the language or frameworks framework or frameworks that you're using. There's a couple different kinds of levels where it's, it can happen. Um, a lot of frameworks will have some kind of level of built-in escaping where it tries to filter um, information by default. Uh, the, um, that can work decently, but is not something I, I put, I say, you know, I put a notice for suspect on there that... Um, I would tend not to rely on it too heavily uh, unless I became very familiar with it and was was absolutely certain that it was working very well. That that it was uh, I, I I tend not I don't want to rely on built in escaping. Just assume that things are working great. Um, most languages and or frameworks are going to have some kind of regular expression library that'll allow you to do complex matching and or replacement. Those things work very well, but they tend to be very complex. Um, this is, I've got a piece of code here that what this does is it matches a valid email address. Um, and you can see that's fairly long and hard to read. Um, if we, I'm pretty familiar with regular expressions and that's kind of hard to understand. If I look through it and break it down, I can see what's going on. If you're not, it's really hard to do. Um, but that's if you don't have other things available to you, most frameworks are going to have some kind of regular expression libraries in it, and that's pretty much what you have to work with uh, to do proper filtering. Um, with higher level uh, stuff, you, you may have, where excuse me, with some frameworks you may have higher level filtering libraries. Um, an example of this is a, a PHP framework, uh, the Zen framework that has a, a Zen filter um, class in it. And the example here was a is a is a method called test email, and you can just pass uh, you know just pass it uh, the incoming value, and it says, hey, is this an email or not? Or it can do things like just return all the alphanumeric characters, or just the alpha characters from a value, or just the numbers, things like that. Strip tag, strip HTML tags out, things of that nature. Um, so that's kind of where you do stuff programmatically. Um, when you get into, one of the things is most web applications probably have some kind of database element that they're using to store data. That typically most web applications have to deal with, with uh, storing or retrieving data for people. Um, and there's a couple things that you can do that really help with avoiding what's called SQL injection, where somebody passes a value that is then inserted, that's uh, placed into uh, a an SQL statement, uh, and then that's executed and does something unexpected, um, not in the intention of the programmer, uh, because they did not filter it properly. Um, what I got down here is some some SQL code, uh, or excuse me, some Java code that uses uh, something called prepared statements. And if you've done uh, much with database work before, you might uh, recognize these kinds of things. Um, and it shows an example of, of something that is susceptible to SQL injection and something that's not. The advantage of using prepared statements is that it's going to pretty much solve all your SQL injection problems. Um, it automatically escapes all the values that get pushed in so that you, it's not going to be able to do something funky like you're, t- you're trying to just do a select against a particular uh, table just to get out some information, and the string that gets passed in is for- is formatted in such a way that it say, reads out all the passwords to the user or something like that, um, or bypasses the standard uh, authentication things or stuff like that. Um, what you see, you can see here in the, in the uh, protected from SQL injection one, the statement has sort of a placeholder. It says uh, select email from member, the member table, where name is equal to, and then it has a question mark, and that's the placeholder for it. Um, and then it uses the uh, uses a function to set what the value is for for that placeholder, 
and then returns that. Again, uh, using prepared statements is going to bypass your SQL injection stuff almost entirely. And unless your framework, for some reason, just doesn't support it, you really should be using these. Um, there are a couple that don't. I think that I think Ruby on Rails doesn't support prepared statements properly, but there are some other similar kinds of uh, escaping that it can do, that kind of thing. Uh, if you don't have prepared statements, generally you're going to end up probably manually escaping input values uh, when you put stuff together. There's some, in general, you're going to probably end up having to manually escape stuff sometimes. And um, that's going to vary. Uh, this is a little piece of PHP code where uh, somebody was just doing a select. Somebody's just doing, a, say, building an SQL statement, a select that would go to a Postgres database, and you're using a, a function called PG escape string. That what that does is that um, uh, escapes any funny characters in in the value uh, so that it can't do anything weird like manipulate the SQL so that it does something other than what the program intends. Um, again, that's going to vary quite a bit, uh, or at least you know what the functions are is going to vary based on you know what language you're working with, what framework you're working with, but uh, if you don't have prepared statement support for some reason, that's what you're going to need to do. Um, some more advanced stuff that you might do when you're working with SQL. Um, you are you might look at doing stuff with stored procedures. What they basically do is encapsulate a bunch of uh, SQL logic, a bunch of database logic, into a single function call, and it's actually stored on in the in the database server itself. Um, it makes it a lot harder to uh, do SQL injections, although it's still possible if you're not careful. Um, but you can also do a fair bit in terms of setting permissions, uh, depending on the database server, but in general you're going to be able to set permissions so that certain users can only, say, run certain uh, prepared, uh, stored procedures, uh, things like that, and that's very advantageous. The other thing, and something I really find very useful and unfortunately I don't see used a lot are views. Um, SQL views are sort of these, re are kind of, they're kind of a, a read-only sort of virtual table that's based on a query uh, that you run and I have a little fancy diagram for that. Um, there, we've got an internal table, this internal personnel table that's in our database server and it has some information in it and we want to get that information, display some of that information out to a website. It also has some information in that table that we don't want getting out, like we don't want to give out things like, let's say their PUID number, they're, 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 because that's supposed to be sort of secret. And um, things like their home email and phone and address, stuff like that. So. Instead of just, um, you know, one way to do that, and you know, a common way of doing that is, well, you just do uh, your select against this same table, the uh, excuse the, the uh, internal personnel table, but you just wouldn't pick those fields. Well, one way to make it really sure that you're not going to be able to do anything, that nothing bad is going to happen, is you would create a view, and I, it might be set up in a whole separate section uh, called. Uh, Public personnel, you could call that, um, and this is this view only has the information that um, that you want to be public. Uh, so, say first name, last name, title, work email, phone, work phone, um, and the web application in this case only would have permission to select uh, and do queries against this public personnel table. So that way, it basically mitigates any uh, issues that you would have with potentially uh, overwriting data or something like that um, because it's read-only and it only contains information that you're okay with being publicly available. Um, that's an approach that we've used uh, at Sirius um, and I think it's worked out very well. I, but I don't see a lot of folks do that and I kind of wish they would. Um, part of the problem is that, uh, especially in open source circles, um, the most popular database server is MySQL, and only with the version with version five, which has come out and uh, been released uh, as a as a, a production release, uh, have views even been supported. And I think that's part of the reason why you haven't seen that at least so much in open source circles. And then the basically the the 
last things I'm going to talk about a little bit are, are is database access stuff and keeping it on sort of a, a need to know basis, and that's a general principle you see all the time. But implementing it uh, for database servers, these are sort of some uh, specifics for that. One of the things I find that um, a lot of web applications don't do is, and I think that they should be doing, is setting up multiple um, uh, database accounts um, with different access capabilities. Um, most of most web applications are either entirely read only, or they are the vast majority of it is read only. Um, you're going to be doing selects out of the out of the database. You're going to just be pulling data out of the database. You're not doing any manipulation of the data. You're not changing data in there. So there's really no reason why those queries, especially if that's the vast majority of the, of, of, of the queries you're doing against the database, there's no reason that the user who's doing those queries should have any kind of write access. Um, there's no reason that they should be able to insert, they shouldn't be able to alter tables, they shouldn't be able to create tables, they shouldn't be able to do any of that stuff. Um, so what I would do is, if you have a situation where you have a web app um, that and most of the time, this is the case that most of your stuff is going to be is, is going to be doing reads, uh, and maybe you have occasional um, inserts for one thing or another. I would simply set up multiple uh, database accounts, um, and they would have you would have one that's is, you know that's very restricted, can only do reads, uh, can only do it on certain tables. Potentially, you could do it only on certain columns, things like that. Um, and then you just use a different user uh, for doing writes, um, but you don't see that too often. Um, bare minimum host access. Um, most, again, the ones I'm most familiar with are MySQL and PostgreSQL, but I'm certain uh, most of the commercial stuff can do it too, where you can restrict certain users to only come from certain hosts, and you know if they're coming from this host, they have only certain capabilities. Um, there's no reason that... Uh, a database should be uh, left open so that, say, any arbitrary IP should be able to access it. Um, if your database is hosted on the same machine as your web server, there's probably very little, if no, there's no reason that you should have um, any kind of uh, networking enabled on it at all. It can just use um, you know, local sockets to, uh, to to connect, there's no reason that you, it should have uh, TCP IP stuff enabled on it. Um, if you had to do administrative access, like from a desktop app or something like that, you could do an SSH tunnel and get in that way. Uh, but there's, but yeah, there's no re there's no reason to have those things turned on. Um, and typically, uh, I see those things turned on and given way more access than there should be. Um, and then. Your SQL box, if you got it as a separate uh, box, should all, I, one approach that I've taken, and it's not always going to be useful for everybody. It's not always going to be possible in every case, but that you set up a network architect, a network architecture where you uh, your SQL database is only going to be accessible from your web uh, server, and I have a fancy little diagram for that. So. Um, we have, uh, you know, a few uh, basic desktop machines on our local network. We have our query supercomputer. And then you have, uh, you have a web server set up, and then you just simply have a private connection uh, over a second. Uh, you know, the, the web server would probably have two Ethernet, Ethernet interfaces and would be running a private connection to the DB server. So that the only way that someone's going to be able to get into the DB server and potentially compromise it is that they first have to go to the web server and compromise that. And hopefully, with all the levels that you build up, that's not going to happen. So that, if, especially if you have private information there, things like credit cards, uh, you know, username and password, uh, private information, things like that. Um, we've done this in the past, and it, it, it's a very effective way of keeping, it's, it, it really restricts uh, people's ability to, to, to get into that thing and, and, and makes it a lot more secure. So... That's pretty much it. Um, I went probably kind of fast, but does, do people have any kind of questions about things? Um, I think. Could you? I'm sorry. Could you hit your button so I can hear you a little better? <laughs> sorry. What type of interesting attacks have you seen coming in? 
Interesting attacks have I seen. Um, there's a general trend. The, the first thing is that there's a general trend. Um, and if you look at SANS uh, 2005 Top 20 Vulnerabilities Report, there's a general trend away from OS level attacks towards application and web app attacks. Um, and attacks moving away from vandalism uh, towards focus attacks that the purpose of which is to almost always retrieve private information that can be used for financial gain by criminals. Um, that's the key thing. So you're seeing these attacks coming through things like, uh, but coming through applications. And generally, especially on the Windows level, what you saw is that, or on the Windows level, uh, with Microsoft has generally done, has finally gotten to the point where they've done a pretty good job um, of locking down their OS. Um, it is in a much better state than it was five years ago. And so, so, what, so the, the situation you have is that you, people have kind of moved away from that. Now, the problem is that web applications and other kinds of applications like media players and things like that, um, five years ago, generally, we didn't think that much about security. I can tell you that uh, five or you know, six or seven years ago, the, the, the code that I wrote was wildly insecure. <laughs> I didn't think about SQL injections, and I didn't think about things like cross-site scripting stuff and things like that. Um, so that's a, that's a sort of a, a, a major change that you're seeing. So there's a general thing towards 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 web application attacks. Um, I think that you're going to. Uh, my suspicion is that you're going to see um, some of the kinds of stuff you've seen before, where you'll see leaks of private information coming out of particular targeted firms. Like, okay, there was some leak where, say, twenty thousand, you know user records who left out that contain social security numbers and things like that, or credit card information, th things of that nature. I think you're going to see attacks against, um, you're going to continue to see attacks against social networking systems um, because those are very popular and they are places where collected information about user, about user information about users is being collected together. Um, and it's very easy for an for some kind of worm or, or, or viral kind of attack to spread because of the nature of it is, you know, that users are all linked together in a big, you know, network. And uh, I think you're going to continue to see that. So far, um, the, 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 most of the attacks that you saw um, that were, say, on, on the MySpace system uh, have been well. No, the 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 spyware one certainly wasn't. That that was a particular. Uh, that was uh, certainly malicious. It wasn't really a proof of concept thing. But um, I think you're going to see more stuff like that. You're going to see them targeted at. The, they see a, a site like MySpace as a great piece where one, the design of that web application that is MySpace, is quite bad in terms of filtering input. They take, uh, you know, what's called a, uh, a blacklisting approach where they try to strip out bad information coming in as opposed to stripping out everything except stuff they know is okay. And they've built an extremely large user base that expects their system to work that particular way because they like to be able to do things like embed arbitrary HTML that lets them put, you know, uh, music videos on their pages and make horrible eye-burning backgrounds and, and animations and stuff like that. And they expect that. And it, it, the, the, with the, the nature of this kind of a business that those folks are in is that they don't want to do anything to upset that and potentially start losing some of that user base. So they're motivated not to correct that problem. They're going to have to keep kind of patching it and hope that they can keep blacklisting certain things. Well, unfortunately, that's generally not going to work. So what you'll see is a, a site like MySpace or other sites like that that have lots of collected information about that are going to be very good vectors of attack for either retrieving information about something about 
uh, people, or gaining access to, say, their local machines or things like that, like, like was done with, with the, uh, the uh, uh, flash banner attack that exploited a whole. Um, and I think you're going to see more stuff like that. Um, and I think you're going to see it get worse before it gets better. Um, I, so I think you're going to see more stuff of that nature. Does anybody else have any other questions? Can we ask a question down here? Can you hear yeah. Um, so, I mean, these are all great things of, in terms of defending systems, but it seems to me it's sort of like, uh, at least for the vast majority of systems being developed, you can do all this, but it doesn't stop the primary project developers from coding in a big security hole right through the middle of everything. Uh, because, you know, the people tying the systems together do whatever they want to do to keep things secure, and they, they might be security experts, but the actual web app developers tend to have no idea what they're doing security-wise. Hey, I'm a web app developer, so be careful. <laughs> well, I didn't say all of them. I said no, I understand, I understand. No, uh, I agree with you entirely. So, you know, you're talking about social networks, and today the big issue is with Facebook, at least on this campus, mm -hmm. and uh, all of the uh, changes they just made to their policy, and while they wouldn't necessarily be security uh, changes in terms of computer security, they definitely affect student security. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it seems there was no thought put into it whatsoever. No. So, so I, I guess the question is the following is, I mean, you've got a lot of expense to do everything you just described because you're going to need someone who's an expert at security to do it all. Mm -hmm. uh, most companies aren't going to hire those people because they're too expensive. Maybe. And even if they do, the web app developer probably put a hole right through the middle anyway. So, so do you really see web apps getting more secure? Well, they have to or we're screwed. I mean, I, 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 that's I, I, not to be blunt or, or, or harsh about it, but um, do I see them getting more secure in the next six months? No. Do I see uh, folks starting to take security more seriously within web application development? Yeah, I do. I think that there's a general trend towards that. Um, I th but I, I also see that, yeah, the majority of web app developers that I run into don't know much about security still. They sort of start to hear about some stuff, but, uh, but uh, th it's, um, they don't really have a good understanding of it. Um, but it's the same kinds of things you're going to run into just as a general application stuff is, do, excuse me, do your programmers know how to write secure code or not? Um, if they don't, there's a, there's a problem, and that's not really that, you know I didn't really address that necessarily in this talk, but I've done some other talks uh, that have tried to talk about that. Of course, they've tried to talk about because it it's a talk, but um, that have 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 brought up these issues and and talked about that there really has to be sort of a multi pronged approach to it. Um, that you not only need to do improvements in terms of the development frameworks that folks are using to develop web applications uh, to make it easier to write secure applications, um, but at the same time also doing a lot in terms of educating developers about those kinds of things. Um, I am not super familiar with, say, uh, you know, most of the, uh, you know, I, when I when I went to college, they didn't have web application development. Uh, but uh, when, but my impression is that they are not pushing security as a particularly important feature uh, of uh, programs in that area. And I think that's a serious problem. Uh, I think that has to change. I think that academics have to make a, a significant change in terms of that. Uh, I think that. People who are doing hiring have to have some understanding of what to look for in, in a developer. And if they don't know the right questions to ask, then they're not going to ask them. Uh, I, I'm not generally a big fan of certifications. I think a lot of certifications don't make a whole lot of sense. But there are some certifications that do make sense. And um, I think a good one, a good example of that is... Um, Zend, which is a, a commercial company that uh, supports PHP stuff, um, has a certification program that includes a, a, quite a bit of security uh, information on it. Uh, I think that's a certification that people should be looking for because I think engineers who have passed that 
demonstrated that they know what they're talking about and they understand security issues and other, you know, obviously other uh, web application development issues. Um, yeah, I mean, part of the reason why you make it multi-layered is that there's a good chance that somebody just isn't competent and, and doesn't know what they're doing. If they don't know how to set up the firewall, then, you know, if they don't know how to set up the firewall uh, application, uh, or excuse me, the firewall appliance, you know, things are going to get through and you have to address it at other levels. But yeah, it's a serious problem. Um, I'm not sure I have a, 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 a great answer for that, but I think there are some key things that we should be doing that we're not. And uh, I know I, I will continue to try to, to try to you know, talk to folks who are developing curriculums and things like that to, uh, to hopefully uh, get them to, to, take, to consider uh, secure programming as a, a key part of any web application uh, courses, web application development courses. So, I don't know if that answered your questions at all, but. Thank you very much. Does anyone uh, come in like me to sign the tenancy?